good that we have the opportunity to be back tonight to worship. We're glad that you're here. If you have your Bible, open it with me, please, to Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to read a few verses there as a basis for our study tonight. Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to begin with verse 1 and read through verse 9. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, or two, shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. This particular text is based upon some individuals, religious leaders actually, who came to Jesus with one intent. They really were not interested in marriage. Verse 3 tells us that they came to Jesus, notice, tempting Him. The enemies of Jesus were constantly striving to find something in order to try to trip Him up. They wanted to prove that He was a mortal, that He was not the Son of God, and they looked for every opportunity. But in this question, they gave Jesus an opportunity to give some of the most wonderful teaching concerning marriage itself. And how fitting as we are approaching the next few months, several getting married, and maybe all of you don't know, but uh, Evan and Meg are getting married this Saturday. Uh, Kayla and Jason are getting married soon. And then shortly thereafter, Aaron and Lindsay are getting married. So I thought, what better timing than to talk about a few things, especially pertaining to making marriage what God would have it to be. Next to becoming a child of God, a Christian, there is no greater step than two people will ever make than to be joined in holy matrimony. We don't hear the term holy matrimony much. Think about it for a moment. When is the last time you heard that? We hear marriage. We may hear someone talk about a wedding, but how often do we hear the the term holy matrimony? You see, with many today, there's nothing holy about it. With many today, it's something used as a means of convenience or for a tax write-off or for just to legalize cohabitation for various reasons. But as we notice our text here in Matthew 19, we find that marriage is something that God created and that God instituted in the Garden of Eden in the long ago. And we need to realize that marriage is the very foundation of the home. And as the foundation of the home, it is also the foundation of society as a whole. And no nation can be any greater than the homes that make it up. If we are to have what many have referred to in in days gone by as a Christian nation, and I understand the way the world uses that term, we must understand that it can only happen if indeed we make marriage Christian in the sense that the Bible teaches, and that God would have it to be. Now, there are definite restrictions placed upon marriage by God. Not our restrictions, but the guidelines that God has given. And you know, we have to take this as it is spoken, but 
someone has observed that marriage can be one of two things. It can be literally a taste a taste of heaven on earth or it can be a taste of hell on earth. It can be a period of bliss and enjoyment and happiness as two people walk together through life hand in hand and side by side or it can be a time of misery when two people are joined together in marriage who do not love one another as they should. Now, what is the basis of making marriage what God would have it to be? Well, first of all, we need to understand that marriage is indeed of divine origin. God designed marriage and the home as a place for our good and for our happiness. And when we remember the fact that God, as our Creator, at the end of each of the six days of creation said, It is good. It is only fitting and proper then when he created Eve and gave her to Adam that that relationship that we know as marriage also was intended for our good. Now there are a couple of things in our text I want us to notice here in Matthew 19. That is, first of all, God made both the man and the woman. In verse 4, Jesus makes a very simple statement. He said, Have ye not read that He which made them? Let's not forget our origin is from God. As a matter of fact, if you want to turn back with me to Genesis chapter 1, let's refresh our memory. In Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Again in chapter 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And then beginning with verse 21 and reading through the end of chapter or well, let's just read through verse 24 of chapter 2. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he, and notice the American Standard says, builded he into a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Oh, but if we only truly understood and took seriously what is spoken here in the long ago. God created us, male and female, in His image. No other living being on earth can make that claim to fame. There is not an animal alive, contrary to what common sentiment and thought seems to be, that has the value of a human being, of a man or a woman. We are different from the animals because we are created in the image of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, Paul said, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Animals don't have an inward man. Animals don't have a soul. They were not created as we were in the image of God. But notice, if you will, also God made male and female differently. 